treatment technologies to reduce nutrient pollution impacts on coral reefs. My name is Petra McGowan, and I am the program manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program, and I'm the host for your session. This webinar is part of a TNC effort to explore the challenge of addressing wastewater and sewage impacts on coral reefs. Our strategy development process is starting with becoming better educated about wastewater and wastewater treatment technologies applicable to improving public health and mitigating nutrient pollution impacts to reefs. TNC is working with CH2M Hill, a global engineering firm and leader in designing and operating wastewater treatment systems to help us learn more, and we're excited to share this information through the Reef Resilience Network. Before we start, I want to share some quick information on how the webinar will work. We will begin the webinar with the presentation, and then we'll take questions from those of you participating at the end. There's two ways you can ask questions. You can use the question box in your control panel at any time during the webinar to send questions, and I'll keep track of those for the end of the session. Or you can raise your hand during the question portion of the webinar, and I will call on you to ask your question directly at that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar on the left of the list of attendees. If you're having any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also send a question to us and let us know and we'll try to help you resolve the issue. So today, Jim Bays, a technology fellow at CH2M Hill, will be presenting and answering your questions. Jim has more than 30 years of experience in the fields of wetland planning, limnology, wildlife and terrestrial ecology, and aquatic biology. He specializes in the planning and design of multi-purpose wetlands for wildlife habitat, water quality treatment, aquifer recharge, and public recreation. Jim has performed comprehensive studies on the water quality and aquatic ecology of a wide range of wetlands, lakes, reservoirs, and estuaries within the United States and actively presents and publishes on wetland treatment and restoration projects nationwide. I would now like to introduce Rob Brumbaugh to provide a bit more background on this project. Rob is a senior scientist at the Nature Conservancy and serves as the lead for the Nature Conservancy's Ocean Solutions Global Strategy. Rob? Very good. Thank you very much, Petra, and thanks all for joining today's Reef Resilience uh, Network presentation and webinar. As, as Petra mentioned, the Nature Conservancy has asked CH2M Hill to bring some information together to help us be better educated about the kinds of technologies that are available for addressing wastewater and sewage pollution in some of the areas where we are currently working on coral reef conservation. The presentation that Jim will give today is part of that education effort and will be informing the development of a strategy for the Nature Conservancy to become more involved and more uh, deliberately addressing uh, wastewater treatment and sewage impacts in coral reef geographies. So this information is something that we thought would be helpful to a great many other people and organizations uh, in addition to the Nature Conservancy, so we're pleased to be able to share this. This is part of a larger collaboration that the Nature Conservancy has with CH2M Hill on a number of fronts. I'd like to ask Elizabeth Bradford, the project manager with CH2M Hill, to uh, perhaps say a few words about how we are working together and CH2M Hill's sustainability purpose. Hi, Rob. Thank you. And thanks to everybody at the Reef Resilience Network for setting this up. Um, as Rob knows, CH2M Hill has a well-established sustainability focus and many years of collaborations on projects throughout the U.S. Um, that led to a five-year collaborative agreement with the Nature Conservancy and CH2M Hill. Um, that collaborative agreement focuses around thought leadership and doing on-the-ground projects in the areas of urban conservation, water resources, and flood protection. And this project fits nicely in, under that umbrella of the collaborative agreement and also um, helps CH2M Hill with their shared purpose to lay the foundation for human progress by turning challenges into opportunities. And I'll let Jim take it from here. Thank you. It's a, hello everybody, this is Jim Bays. It's a real privilege to be able to present to you today. 
I hope at the end of our talk that you will feel that there is a hope for reefs, that there is a way that we may improve water quality and, and help protect these sensitive environments. Our objective here really is to provide a very broad overview of proven wastewater technologies to improve water quality. Uh, and we are helping that by providing some case histories to demonstrate the feasibility of this approach. And we've selected case histories are already from the Caribbean settings so that we can show that these methods are applicable in areas that are of interest to this group. Our goal really is to help you develop a general understanding of technologies and their potential application to address water quality concerns now and over time. So we've kind of divided our approach here into a series of uh, levels of classes. We call uh, the basics 101, as if you were wastewater 101, as if you were back in college here. And uh, we move on into a 201 framework, and the other materials we're producing with TNC uh, kind of wor work up in sophistication there. Just to provide a very basic starting point, we define wastewater as consisting of really three types of water in the context that we are working in, typically. Uh, black water, that is human waste, the fecal matter that is now disposed of in a, in a wastewater system. Uh, storm water, which is a runoff from rainfall and precipitation. And uh, gray water, which is a may simply be washings, but typically doesn't have a direct contact with uh, human fecal matter. Uh, in different parts of the world, we see gray water separated out separately and, and uh, discharged uh, differently than from the normal wastewater programs. Uh, the different types of treatment include, it, with a focus on uh, treatment of organic wastes, that is the uh, solids and the carbon and uh, associated uh, materials that are in wastewater are allowed to settle and uh, decompose ultimately to uh, carbon dioxide and, uh, and water. Uh, for nitrogen, phosphorus, and nutrients that typically cause problems in surface waters, the wastewater treatment uh, focuses on removing them by through a sedimentation where they are attached to in solid form or converting them through biological transformations to nitrogen gas or to uh, assimilating them into biological tissues for later disposal. We typically consider wastewater treatment as a series of steps, uh, primary treatment for reduction of solids, uh, sedimentation of gross particles, and then a secondary process where we uh, add air to the uh, wastewater to help improve its uh, treatment condition. Uh, we might additionally add additional chemicals in a third step or a fourth step to get to very high levels of treatment and low levels of nutrients. Most of the examples we'll present today are focusing on the primary, secondary, and tertiary level of treatment. A typical wastewater system is not just the treatment system. It includes the collection of wastewater and bringing that to the uh, treatment site. That conveyance may, may, have, may simply be a gravity float or may be, have to be pumped and, uh, and uh, energy and used to bring the water to the treatment center. The treated water then has to be conveyed either to a surface discharge or to a uh, uplands can, upland area for infiltration or use and use and reuse as irrigation water. Uh, this entire process uh, needs to work hand in hand. The flow needs to come to the treatment plant. The treatment plant needs to receive it and treat it as it's at the flow it's coming in, and it needs to be able to discharge uh, without uh, any changing the flow. So. These things have to be worked out in, in concert together. For We see several types of systems of wastewater treatment. Uh, at the most basic level, at the home level, uh, people may use septic tanks to treat their daily uh, flows. And the, the water that's settled, after the water is settled through the septic tank, it may be disposed of through a drain field, uh, lost to the soil and adjacent to the residence. And this is commonly, uh, still is a very common method of waste disposal in the U.S. and around the world. Increasingly, we see opportunities in situations where multiple homes might feed to a central treatment facility at a very small scale, and that goes to a drain field. We call these cluster systems. Typically, we're looking at smaller flows on the order of 10,000 gallons per day. The individual home flow rate might be on the order of 100 to 200 or more gallons per day, depending on the water use. Satellite systems are combinations of, of homes, businesses, uh, hotels, different types of systems that generate waste.
that are fed to a small-scale treatment facility for ultimately discharge. Typically, they're, they may be too large to discharge to drain fields in, in the uh, or soil systems. They tend to be larger in flow, 100,000, 300,000 gallons per day. They may be more homes in the order of a small village, potentially. Uh, most commonly, though, we see centralized systems where different towns or municipalities send their flows to a central treatment facility and thereby gain the benefits of an economy of scale of treatment uh, and consistency of treatment before discharge and, and the subsequent uh, changes in, in, the, in the water flow. So that's just a very general overview of how these things are configured and what's important. What I wanted to do now is to go through the what we call the seven technologies and project examples. We've imagined a situation in parts of the world where, particularly in sensitive areas, where housing may, and the population may reside in a wide range of conditions. They may be very sparse housing, small villages, there may be up to very large cities. But the wastewater treatment attached to that population center may be substandard or may be very primitive. For example, we can imagine that uh, in some areas, in developing areas, there's very uh, prevalence of cesspools or latrines or at best may not even have some of these basic on-site treatment systems. And the larger facilities may be present, but they may be overloaded because of the potential for uh, uh, essentially the, the growth exceeding the wastewater capacity. So we've thought in our selection of case histories uh, that there must be examples out there where people have been implementing solutions for these kind of situations, and we've tried to bring them to you here in this presentation. So our seven technologies, just to generally quickly outline, include on-site sewage disposal systems, septic tanks, but enhancements to those that are being tested and applied in Florida, a wastewater stabilization ponds, an example from Jamaica, constructed wetlands, uh, another small example from West Indies, an activated sludge treatment plant, pretty much the go-to or conventional wastewater approach uh, from a site in the Keys in Florida. Package plants, uh, another site in Florida. A membrane bioreactor system uh, from with an example of resorts in St. Thomas. And wastewater reuse as a method of treatment. And the intent here is to show that this range of technologies, uh, which are widely applied, uh, really can span the range of conditions that we might see in the watersheds of sensitive areas and providing us potentially with a tool set that then we can draw from to help find the right wastewater solution. So starting with septic tanks, uh, these are simply uh, vessels or containers where wastewaters are allowed to settle and the anaerobic processes in these, in these uh, settling tanks reduce the solids and organic content. The overflow from these tanks is clarified and is left passively through this settling process and infiltrates into the ground or in some cases can be transported to sewer for more of a communal treatment. There's typically size for the home uh, flows or the generally the population living in that residence or the building. Uh, they appropriate for rural areas because it may just be simply be very difficult to run collector pipes to different uh, houses. They're relatively low tech and simple to maintain. And they can be improved, though, by adding treatment capacity, as we show in our example here coming up. So the, standard, the most standard application is that these are treating black water and gray water from the individual residents. They're really focused on getting rid of the gross solids. Uh, there's very little attention normally in septic tanks to treating nutrients. And it's, so it functions essentially as a form of primary treatment. Here's a cross-section of a typical on-site disposal system where the water comes in. Uh, it, so the solids fall out, uh, the flow moves from, uh, uh, from the tank itself into the drain field adjacent to that. The pipes there allow the flow to be enter into the drain field without capturing solids or foam or other things that are going to potentially clog those, those fields. The case study we wanted to speak to is a test being done in Florida uh, by the uh, Florida Department of Public Health. It's a two-stage passive nitrogen reduction system. The issue here is that in Florida, there are many cases, as there are in, uh, in anywhere the, in the country or the, the world where they're using septic tanks, where the organic nitrogen and the nitrogen from the wastewater itself converts to nitrate, uh, nitrogen, oxidized nitrogen in that passage through soil. And that becomes a, a, a form of uh, both pollution for public health concerns as well as receiving water quality 
And uh, the intent here is with the addition of a post-treatment process to a septic tank is to improve that nitrate reduction. They built one as an example for a single family dwelling with uh, three bedrooms and two residents and essentially yielded this kind of cross section where the flow from the septic tank <clears throat> was fed into what they uh, a stage one unsaturated flow bed. Water was trickled in from the top, allowed to flow through a sandy media. In that process, that nitrogen in there is converted, uh, any nitrate that's converted in there, then it goes into a stage two saturated by a filter. The stage two filter was filled with wood chips, uh, lignocellulosa compounds, and also had some sulfur compounds attached. The wood chips provide a source of carbon that helps degrade that organic nit that uh, nitrate uh, passively and biologically uh, through the process of denitrification. And the uh, sulfur was uh, attached as a way to form a different form, a different pathway for uh, denitrification. But the system operates uh, passively except for the addition of a tank that recirculates flow for the first stage. And that recirculation continues to, prop continues to convert that nitrate, nitrogen to nitrate. Results of this study were very uh, uh, compelling. The recirculation tank in the stage one biofilter removed uh, over half of the total nitrogen. The, by the time the water had moved through the second stage of this uh, system in series, uh, almost all the nitrogen had been reduced down to about 93% of it had been removed. And this figure shows that the uh, total, the organic nitrogen and ammonia were essentially reduced to baseline levels coming out of the system and the nitrate had been reduced in the first pass through the wood chips. So, so the importance of that essentially is that at the septic tank level there are methods of improvement that can be added to uh, these things to uh, improve water quality. So moving on up in scale now to wastewater stabilization ponds, these are engineered water bodies. They're, they can be termed aerobic where they are mixed um, and, with, and allowed to uh, become entrained with oxygen in the surface layer or facultative where there's no mixing and they're deeper and they tend to go uh, lower in oxygen and anaerobic towards the sediments. The wastewater ponds provide both a method of storage of waste over a long period of time. They can be typically designed with capacity for years of storage, but they also have very long residence times. Uh, that is, the amount of water stays in there for very long periods, and that allows for settling and in situ decomposition of the waste. Ponds are built for almost every scale, from the community and small town level up to very large cities. Again, lower tech and simple to operate, but they can be scalable to accommodate growth by adding on additional ponds. Uh, there is a requirement, though, for additional land area, and that can limit them in some cases. We've seen these used for most every type of wastewater, uh, and they do provide additional levels of nitrogen and phosphorus removal that you don't get with a septic tank type approach. So they are a step up in the level of treatment, both providing primary and secondary treatment. Here's a typical cross-section of what we might imagine to be a series, a, a sequence of ponds where the anaerobic pond is designed to be deeper initially, uh, taking the screen flows, the, the uh, flows were separated from solids and flowable material, and uh, allowed to settle over time. And that goes into a, a sequence of consecutively shallower cells where there's more opportunity for mixing and exchange with, of oxygen with the air to provide additional treatment. And these, things, these systems vary in depth, uh, essentially, the 6 to 16 feet or so deep on the anaerobic beds, designed to be very uh, deep to store sludge over time to consecutively deeper, uh, shallower systems with residence times in the order of 7 to 30 to additional 20 days. So these provide a long time for uh, algae to take up nutrients and, uh, and settle to the bottom for pathogens that are in the water to be degraded passively through contact with ultraviolet radiation and, and uh, in aerobic systems. So the example we selected here is from Jamaica. It's the Soapberry Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's a, essentially serving a town of a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, it is part of a larger program to improve wastewater quality in discharges to Kingston Harbor Bay. It's the, built by uh, the government, but in a joint and public-private partnership with a local developer and it's managed by uh, the Wastewater Operation and Management Company uh, for the National Water Commission. So it's a very large scale uh, application of ponds. This figure shows the general layout, uh, thanks to our friends at Google Earth, and it shows the ponds in a series of radiating uh, segments. As you can see from these pie-shaped uh, basins, 
the water is coming in at the small end of that and allowed to move out through the ponds and age and settle with time, and that moves into the secondary ponds and, and a, final, a final polishing pond. Water from this system is then taken and run through a sand filter to provide a, a water quality that's potentially amenable for reuse, and it does discharge then to the, the harbor. But this has been a significantly beneficial project. There's been localized improvements in environmental conditions downstream. And as I said, they're moving this, they see this as a step towards creating more of a reuse flow. And these ponds, because they can be sized with uh, extra capacity, this one here is particularly in size to receive flows from other regional wastewater plants as part of the strategy to improve local water quality. But you can see the large surface area for a system like that. So moving to the next technology, constructed wetlands. Uh, our example here is from West Indies. First, a general description of what we mean by that. These are shallow water bodies or gravel or engineered media-filled basins that are planted with plants that are adapted to continuous or periodic inundation. And the basins are engineered in a way to allow a smooth flow of water through the system and a sheet flow and designed to uh, provide a, a optimal contact time for the water to come in contact with the soil, uh, the plant roots, the plant biological materials, and the microbial communities attached to those materials. The neat reason for, the basis for picking a constructed wetland uh, is, is they're very wide ranging. They can be applied to any size community from the uh, home scale, the residence scale, up to large cities. There are examples of all cases and all sizes in the world now. They're relatively simple to implement. It's digging a basin and planting with plants. And they can be modified to increase the degree of wastewater treatment, either by addition of other approaches, other additional air, or they can be modified further. They can be ecologically important, though, and this is why they're in our select, selected group of technologies. It's often the case that these wetlands become uh, really attractive to wildlife. And this may be actually an economic driver for some communities where people come to visit these sites because of their high bird density, and they become uh, a, a, a destination for, for bird watchers. And that can bring economic value to it. Wetlands have been used for every type of strength of wastewater. They do provide additional nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So they're secondary and greater in their potential quality. Additional wetlands in series can help increase the performance. And systems can be sized for any wide range. Here's a typical cross-section of what we mean by that. The top one is what we termed a free water surface wetland, shallow water bodies with flooded plants. The bottom one is more of a subsurface flow, where the water flows through the root zone and the soil zone as a hydroponic flow uh, below the surface, coming in contact with the soil and microbial communities. The example we picked, we selected from West Indies in Antigua. It was built for a development by a development company. It happened to be close to an airport and uh, by a banking center. They wanted something that looked good uh, as a wastewater solution, but it must be quiet. That is, so they were right from the start uh, against a mechanical facility, and they wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it would use the, all the reuse water produced by this system would be used for irrigation and it would be adjacent to this new facility. So here's uh, a picture of it uh, where we look, you can see the wetland is kind of configured as a series of terraces uh, on a hill slope adjacent to the buildings next to this, uh, at this location. And the top few uh, bodies here, the top few cells are gravel bed systems. Uh, on the order of a four, about four tenths of an acre in size, not so large in this case, and followed by open water wetlands that are polishing the effluent from the gravel beds, and they help serve as an equalization basin because flows can vary in all of these uh, situations. There's always a need to encounter and anticipate the daily flow or seasonal flows that you can ex you can expect. In this particular case, they had to screen and separate the wastewater solids before it goes into the wetland to avoid clogging, and they built a canopy over the uh, primary treatment, the separation center there to take air from that and put it through a soil filter so there would be no odors. This system is sized for 83,000 gallons per day, so obviously much larger than a small municipality or small residence, but not as large as a, as a city. But this achieved a good performance for its system, for its size, achieved a better than secondary level of quality for BOD, nitrogen, phosphorus. And so the thing to keep in mind in all of these examples is that all of these are a significant step up from 
latrines or cesspits or basically even the un, un, un amended uh, septic tank systems. So our next example is a larger scale system, what we call activated sludge. This is a biological treatment process common now worldwide through most, uh, most municipal treatment systems where the biology of the system is managed by a constantly mixing a basin of wastewater, feeding it air, and growing the, uh, essentially growing bacteria as a flock that floats through the water, it, uh, is absorbing and assimilating nutrients and carbon in the water, in the wastewater, and transforming that or uh, converting that into CO2 or, or water or converting it into uh, nitrogen gas. The same process we described earlier is happening in a mixed and kind of a turbulent water column. These bacterial communities degrade the organic matter, they assimilate the nutrients, and it happens that a process is very rapid. It only takes a few hours for most of this process to take place. It's well understood and is relevant to a large range of sizes of communities. This approach is commonly used for both organic wastewater as, as to treat organic waste as well as to improve nitrogen phosphorus content and uh, is typically seen as the secondary treatment methodology now worldwide. But because of the size of these systems and the need for uh, high flows and sustain them, they tend to be uh, centralized. They're taking the flow from the neighborhoods and, and communities and treating it in one place. Here's a cross section of an example of that where the water coming in is, is aerated, the circulated. Uh, the water coming from that aeration tank is, flows into a clarifier. The clarifier allows the, the bacterial solids to settle out and that uh, activated sludge is, is then recirculated back into the initial tank, provide a seed source and a, a source of inoculum and attachment for the new bacteria to grow. And some of that is, is wasted away and, and put off and turned into solids and, and allowed and disposed of off-site. Water from this facility can be then fed through a sand filter for additional polishing, as is commonly the case in reuse applications. Here's an aerial view of one of these facilities here. You can see the aeration tanks more towards the middle left of the screen. Uh, the clarifiers are in the middle section, and aerobic uh, sludge digesters are attached uh, to the right. So this is your common uh, centralized wastewater treatment system. One example we selected is in Florida, in the Florida Keys. And again, we were seeking you know, examples that might look like or resemble those situations in uh, the Caribbean or the Coral Triangle where uh, we are concerned about wastewater affecting the near shore uh, waters. Uh, this is a case where it took a, both a regional, state, and federal level collaboration to collect the flows from uh, septic tanks that had been built uh, over decades in the Keys to bring it to one location for centralized treatment to help remove and, uh, the source of pollution to the near shore waters. And it's a, this is all based upon a wastewater master plan that had been built on, uh, set up in the county from, uh, and took over 10 years to get to a point of completion. But it collects over 2 million gallons a day as, as collectively eventually from all the, these areas. Um, here's an example of the facility showing three uh, uh, bio, uh, essentially, uh, three uh, biological reactors that are essentially treating uh, the aerated water, wastewater, oops, and uh, discharging that through uh, either a deep injection well in this particular case or recirculating that for uh, localized reuse here. Uh, this, uh, what's special about the Key Largo example is that they're collecting flows from such a large area that they can't really economically get to every uh, every street, every small neighborhood. So some of the neighborhoods that are within this wastewater plan are receiving treatment at a smaller scale. Uh, they're being treated at a, a decentralized facilities uh, uh, scattered throughout. But largely, most of the flow has been collected and brought to the centralized facility. The uh, initial results of this uh, conversion and treatment system are very good. There's significant improvements in water quality. The raw wastewater itself has oxygen demands on the order of 200 milligrams per liter, very high, and that's nothing you'd want to see going into surface waters and, and rarely do. But this is the strength of what's coming out of, uh, of wastewater. That is treated down to a level of about 2 milligrams per liter, very significant reduction, an order of 99%. Now, the ammonia values are very low, nitrogen values are very low, phosphorus values are very low, down to uh, and better than the discharge criteria that were selected here. So it's a matter of 
being able to collect the flow and provide a level of treatment to discharge. Uh, and that's the case here with this particular form. Now, a smaller version of the waste activated sludge or the activated sludge approach is uh, typically constructed in the form of package plants. These are pre-engineered and prefabricated uh, systems. They come as skid mounted units typically. They use activated sludge technology where the wastewater is screened, then aerated, and sludge uh, recirculated and allowed to create that biological growth medium to take up the nutrients and uh, organic wastewaters. And they're typically designed to achieve a certain level of performance for a certain flow. And they can be used in a range of community sizes. They can be readily built and transported. And they can be further modified to achieve de advanced degrees of treatment. Uh, they're relatively simple to operate with relatively low labor requirements. They're built for a wide range of water qualities. As I said, they can provide a level of treatment. But because they're small and transportable, they can be used at cluster or satellite or even centralized scale. Here's a cross-section schematic of water coming from a, in this case, our hypothetical tourist uh, resort, where the water is coming in, it's to a flow equalization tank, and then it's going to an aeration tank and into a clarifier. Uh, that clarifier water is, uh, uh, the sludge from that is then discharged back to a sludge holding tank or recirculated back to the aeration tank. In this particular case, because they're using it for the water from, uh, for irrigation, it's passing through a disinfection unit. But the intent here is to say that as wastewater needs uh, evolve within communities and population growth centers, there may be ways of bridging the wastewater treatment gap by selecting technologies that fit um, for certain flow ranges. And a package plan approach provides a convenient way to get to that level of performance here. Um, our small case history for this is set in Florida uh, for the community of Ave Maria where we, both a water treatment plant and a water reclamation facility was built. Uh, this uh, facility provides uh, wastewater treatment for a developing community. Uh, it's managed by a contractor on site. And that community includes both houses as well as, besides houses, it includes hotels and schools and parks. Here's a general cross overview of the, of the whole facility here. It's designed to treat over a million gallons per day. It's a package plant, but it's been built, built in sections and laid out over a large area with the intent that as growth comes, the flow will come with it and they'll have to treat it. Uh, there's a the raw water uh, pumped in and the, the, uh, it is allowed then distributed to different, a clarifier basin as well as uh, aeration systems. The intent is to show that these are relatively compact units that are easily treated. Uh, there's a, a substantial series of treatment mechanisms built into the uh, system here with the idea that we're creating water that is suitable for irrigation and uh, reuse. So the, one of the factors involved in this project is that it was, it's a community built from scratch. That is, this is a greenfield town. Nothing existed there before. And the intent was to build in a, a really expandable uh, treatment system over time to meet that growth expectation. And uh, they were able to uh, facilitate the planning for this through uh, detailed discussions with the local regulators as well as and planning for the equipment to be brought in as it's needed over time as a system population grows. So the other technology uh, that pertains to uh, wastewater treatment in developing communities is the use of membrane bioreactors. Uh, now, this is a more higher tech version of the waste activated sludge version. It's still basically an aerated basin of wastewater, uh, providing opportunities for biological growth. But instead of the solid separation process uh, uh, through uh, clarification and uh, filtering and uh, settling, uh, it's all happening through an immersed membrane. The, the membrane itself is, is, is immersed in this fluid, and water is cleaned as it passes through that membrane into that, uh, into the per what's called the permeate through that membrane. Water, the clean water through the membrane, then goes for for its discharge or treatment. There's a very high solids removal efficiency. It takes out carbon and nutrients and leaves a very high quality wastewater. Because it doesn't require some of the same type of uh, clarification system as the larger plants, it has a relatively small footprint and can be used in moderate to high density communities. Uh, primary drivers for building membrane bioreactor systems have been the need to come up with a very high quality reuse as well as low, with low nutrients and uh, or, forest, or, or maybe there's just simply no other land area available for 
larger systems. And this approach has been used commonly for both secondary and tertiary treatment in a wide range of community types. Here's a cross section showing the, again, the kind of the first part of the process being the activated sludge where the aerated wastewater is recirculated. But the water that's being discharged is, is working its way through this membrane system, of which there are many varieties and vendors and types of membranes. Now it's a, it's a completely new separate industry of how to make these membrane systems. But the final product water is quite good in quality. Here's an example of what these membrane bioreactors look like. Uh, it's quite high-tech looking, and it looks very different than your typical uh, activated sludge uh, settling system. This can, one of the advantages of membrane bioreactors is they come in a wide range of sizes. Just as package plants do, the MBRs, as they're called, uh, also provide a level of uh, a treatment in a very small footprint. And they can be brought in at, on, at, uh, on skid-mounted units or very small transportable units. One resort in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands uses a membrane bioreactor to treat the wastewater from the resort community and then you reuse that wastewater for irrigation. Uh, it's a 30,000 gallon per day system. It's a screening, equalization tank, and an aeration basin with four different membrane modules. The effluent is used for irrigation, as I said, uh, and other non potable uses such as washing, truck washing, and car washing and stuff. It needs very little in the way of operational attention. Uh, the performance here is quite good, as I, similar to what I showed earlier. The VOD is treated from over 100 milligrams per liter down to 6. Sabinosol is also a 99% level of removal. And nutrients are also proportionally smaller than with a typical treatment system. So as a final example of a technology, it's, it's really a broader view. It's, it's a, we're looking at wastewater reuse as a technology in and of itself. It takes water that's been treated, and that could be through an activated sludge process or a membrane bioreactor, and the intent is to replace the water that's otherwise being used for, for, for non-potable uses, such as irrigation or washing and such, or even potentially using it, the product water, as a the direct potable source of water that is making water supply from it. And the intent here is that in some of these uh, what we view as some of these very uh, water-challenged areas uh, where what clean water or available water is very limited. Uh, you don't really want to waste it, uh, water that's of good quality for drinking, but you want to reuse as much of the uh, wastewater as possible. So the, a reuse system uh, of, by design will let you do that. And now the intent here is to irrigate typically, so that it's used as a source of water for agriculture or uh, um, uh, for communities. Uh, but as I said earlier, there's increasing interest in using water that's been treated through these kind of membrane processes and reuse systems as a source of potable water. Reuse systems re really require the same pretreatment steps. The influent goes through primary and secondary treatment, but they also add in additional disinfection and filtration to achieve a water that's low in pathogens and is going to be safe for the public to have in contact. And this has been implemented at a wide range of scales. Some of their considerations are that the community needs to be brought into the process and uh, the and a level of acceptance uh, brought to the uh, technology. People need to understand that wastewater for uh, reuse of wastewater is is safe and publicly and within public uh, bounds of aesthetics and uh, and uh, safety, and that's typically the case. The maintenance for these types of systems uh, is mostly involved with maintaining the hydraulics of the system, moving the water through the treatment system, handling the filters and the backwash from the filters, and then the disinfectants to provide the final level of polishing and disinfection to make it safe for use. One example of this recently is completed for the city of Benita Springs Utilities in uh, Florida. It's a, a, another growing community, and they wanted to reuse the wastewater uh, to to lessen the impact and lessen the demand for potable water supply from their other sources. And this is a common trend throughout all of Florida and any arid or, or a water short area these days. The intent was to, to make it a high-tech solution, use tertiary treatment through the membrane process to provide a high level of nutrient reduction, and then reuse that water. So here's just an aerial view of showing this the setup for this particular site. This is a, a somewhat uh, smaller footprint type of project where there's large ponds here designed to take uh, a day or so of extra flow from the system or to hold wastewater for equalization. Uh, but the large, uh, most of the activity in this particular site is more towards the center in these aeration basins and in the membrane bioreactors towards the middle. 
And the intent here is that the reuse process itself focuses on taking the water from that treatment process, uh, disinfecting it and filtering it, and then returning that to the community for wastewater uh, reuse. The, this is an automated system. Uh, it's uh, largely uh, uh, very, very centralized and automated. Uh, requires a high level of, of maintenance and operation, but it achieves 100% reuse of all the water. And the solids that are produced from this waste activated sludge process are, are be able to use for fertilizer. So those are the seven overview uh, overview of seven of the technologies. Um, I hope that you can see from this range that there are uh, a number of types of systems that may be uh, fit to different needs. One question we always are asked is, well, what, is these, what do these things cost? How do we evaluate the cost of, of, of progressing the wastewater treatment system beyond the most rudimentary up to something that actually is protective of our, the systems we want, to, we want to protect? Well, each one of these has a unique cost signature. Uh, On-site sewage treatment disposal systems, like we mentioned, typically are very cheap to build. Septic tanks and even the add-ons to improve the, the performance, they can add several thousand dollars in cost to a unit, but they're very small. They're just occasionally. So the total cost is relatively low. But because they are uh, uh, relatively uh, small flows, there's a very small economy of scale. And so the unit cost per pound removed of a nutrient it tends to be somewhat high on these systems. The larger you go as a system, as you go from increasing in size from ponds to wetlands or go to an activated sludge system, the unit cost tends to decrease because there's that much more flow going to the system. The higher tech solutions like membrane bioreactors tend to have a higher cost because they're more expensive to build, they require more energy to operate, the training in, is to operate these systems is more expensive and more rigorous and there's a, more of a, a, an operational management approach that is more expensive to implement. And reuse systems, because they also include both conveyance as well as disinfection systems, can be expensive to uh, operate. Um, but the benefit is there, that they save water and they can be useful for that purpose. Um, so this suite of combinations, the unit cost, uh, variability, the range in operations and maintenance uh, for different technologies, uh, the total cost, are all part of an analysis that has to be done to evaluate how best to move uh, the water quality improvement uh, uh, mechanisms in place towards the goals that are intended. So there's really a wide range of technologies that uh, span the range from household to city. Uh, we've shown you uh, examples of each and it's also true that you can mix and match these different approaches. Uh, they can be combined for a greater performance that is, wetlands can be attached to ponds to provide additional levels of nitrogen or phosphorus reduction or in, in combination with other technologies. Uh, and what we see is that population centers grow, uh, populations grow and flows increase. There's almost always an evolution towards a more centralized approach simply for the fact that there's a need to achieve an economy of scale of feeding as flows and, and provide a more consistent level of reduction. Uh, and this is a, a common uh, effort throughout most coastal communities of the, of the world as they move from their uh, residence-based or small-scale uh, treatment systems, there's almost always a need to kind of consolidate and coalesce those treatments into single facilities. But these costs can vary widely, as I said, but increasing flows can lead to these economies of scale. So uh, we're, I think I've left time here on purpose for questions, and I've moved rather quickly because of the breadth and the extent of the information we have, but I'm happy to uh, take questions here in the, uh, from the group. Great. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to be asking you a couple questions that have been chatted into me, and then also if participants uh, would like to ask their question directly, they can raise their hand and I can unmute them. So the first question here we have is, um, is the treatment performance of a constructed wetland reduced when the inflow wastewater, typical black water, has high concentrations of sulfide, let's say 15 milligrams a liter. How, to ha how do you handle this? Okay, <clears throat> that's a good question there. It's a, uh, sometimes we see when wastewater has been sitting in ponds or in uh, a storage facility of some kind that it's gone septic, that is that there, that is the aerobic content is very low, uh, it's, it's anaerobic, the uh, sulfur is 
any sulfates that are in the water have now been transformed to sulfides, and this is, of course, the rotten egg smell that people associate with wastewater. Uh, typically, this is not an issue of significant concern on constructed treatment wetlands for municipal uh, purposes like this. Um, the, the questioner asks, asks a good question because it is possible to have too much sulfur in a system. If those levels are 15 milligrams per liter, which are normally toxic to aquatic life, uh, they are quickly assimilated in a constructed wetland, such as the ones we're describing here. Uh, that, and that's because in the anaerobic uh, root zones, uh, the uh, soil community within, residing within the wetland itself, they're already pre-adapted to some level of sulfide and present in the water. Uh, that is, they're accustomed to living in anaerobic environments where sulfides may be quite present and prevalent. Uh, I would think that the the key issue here in sizing a wetland for uh, treating a, a water with those kind of characteristics is looking at the sizing and, and ensuring that the flow of water is proportional, the, the area of the wetland is proportional to the flow of water. Uh, that level of sulfide removal, that level of sulfide will be readily attenuated in the, in the wetland as it enters. Um, it does point, it's, the, one other aspect of that question that's helpful is that it points to the fact that not always are we really worried about nitrogen or phosphorus or organic carbon in a wastewater flow. There may be other constituents that we need to look at, and it points to that potential. But again, the closing on that is because these are systems adapted to anaerobic conditions where sulfide is a common uh, parameter, uh, that wetlands will be able to treat that water. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. So we have a lot of questions coming in, so <laughs> the next one. What is your experience with success of aerated treatment units at a household level removing nutrients and bacteria? Can you speak about maintenance of these types of units? Yeah, the, that's a good question. And we, uh, because of the kind of the breadth of material here, we didn't want to get into every possible uh, site. But these are the questions we anticipated would bring that out of it. Uh, the aerated units are um, uh, in, in addition to septic tanks to help provide uh, oxygen to help transform that uh, carbon that's in the wastewater uh, to more benign forms uh, and help to uh, nitrify any or, or ammonia organic nitrogen that's in the water. In the example that I showed of the case study being tested in Florida, that's really what's going on in that first stage, if you remember that. Uh, it was a, essentially a downflow uh, media bed in recirculated water. That's adding oxygen each pass, it's converting that, uh, those compounds to uh, carbon dioxide or, or nit nitrates. Uh, the, the success of these systems uh, is somewhat problematic. That is, the owner needs to be able to get in there and con confirm that the pumps are operating at their appropriate level, that they're not uh, neglected or, uh, and, or uh, just ignored. Most homeowners don't really have much of a level of sophistication on this matter, uh, as much as they may wish to. And the solution has been, in those areas where those are actually uh, applied as a solution, a contractor can be hired to come to that site and maintain and check those units. Now, to, to maybe the best or better answer the, the, questioners, uh, the question, uh, these units do last a long time. They're designed to be an, uh, working in tough conditions, and they'll operate. But like any with the addition of any mechanical operating feature to something like a septic tank, there's always going to be the need to make, to confirm that it's working and it's working at the, up to spec. And this is, as I said, the solution for some areas where these have been implemented is to have a contractor maintain that for folks. So I guess my experience has been that uh, there's always there's always a, a case history where you see if you encounter problems, but the general uh, expectation is that the performance will be good. Uh, and the caveat is that it must be must be periodically checked and maintained. Okay. Uh, another question. I'm going to actually call on um, Kirsten directly. So let's pick an unmuter. Kirsten, you want to ask your questions? Sure. Hopefully, uh, you can hear me well. I was just quickly doing You're fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, could you tell? Yep. Jim, this is great. This is really helpful. Um, could you comment a little bit on how these different systems vary in their ability to remove other chemical compounds found in wastewater, such as human medications and endocrine, endocrine disrupting compounds? Right, Kirsten, it's a good question. It's very, people are, are very interested in knowing that 
not only are we handling the more traditional pollutants, but there is some effort at handling what are called the emerging contaminants of concern, you know, the pharmaceutical products, uh, medical wastes, uh, things like that that are in the wastewater stream, typically at very low levels, trace levels. And what's been known is that this, the traditional waste activated sludge system does provide a level of treatment. It might be on the order of 60 to 80 percent potentially on most of these that have been measured. It's not complete though. Some of these compounds are resistant to aerobic treatment. Uh, they uh, are many medical medications are designed uh, to essentially be uh, uh, either not assimilated by wastewater processes. They're supposed to go directly into the bloodstream and there may be, they may have a very little uh, bit of a, there may be very little assimilation potential there. But what we found is that in systems like constructed wetlands or using a soil-based filtration system that we see additional treatment of those compounds on the order of an additional 60 to 80 percent. That is, you can work your way down that concentration scale. You see significant reductions in the concentrations of most of these constituents. Um, and that's because in those environments, there are very complex microbial communities that are adapted to a wide range of carbon sources as their, for their food supply. And the nature-based approach is that you find a natural system that uh, is that it has the capacity to evolve or accept those uh, those different waste products as food sources and they decompose those readily over time. Uh, I'd say that if the case the cases that we're seeing now are that the case that we're seeing now is that if people look to see uh, wastewater reuse for potable uses coming out of a, 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 a wastewater plant which is the case in parts of the US and other parts of the world there's typically a, fir a final step uh, if you recall that first graphic I showed, the, the tertiary and quaternary levels of treatment, that fourth step is typically an advanced oxidation process or some other membrane separation where those different constituents are removed uh, and destroyed completely in a, in a, in a very advanced uh, chemical or uh, oxidation step. And it's possible to treat those down to undetectable levels using that process. So to Kirsten, to summarize my answer, I'd say that for the average treatment um, uh, process here, as we go, our, as we work our way up from septic tanks up to the more conventional way activated sludge processes, we see increasing ability and in performance in reducing these contaminants. If we add in a biologically based system like a wetland, uh, we see additional polishing. If we have to go to levels that are extremely uh, low concentrations for public use, then the typical Typically, a four-step of an advanced, uh, advanced oxidation is added. I hope that answers your question. Um, I had to mute her, Jim, so I think it, I think it did. She'll chat in if she has an, any follow-up. That's fine. Up. Okay, so how. I've got another question. So how well do the lower tech options, like the wetland treatment systems, handle saline flows? Seawater intrusion into collection systems are common in tropical coastal settings. That's an excellent question, and we've worked with that ourselves. <clears throat> and I think that's a, uh, the answer is that uh, for wetlands in particular, there's a uh, uh, there's potentially even more uh, potential benefits than we might see with some of the other wastewater processes. And that is because we can select plants that are adapted to brackish water conditions. Uh, many of the wastewater constructed waste wetlands for wastewater treatment are are vegetated with plants that are naturally uh, nature survivors, you know, they can they're able to take very difficult soil and water conditions and they often can handle a wide range of salinity conditions. Uh, in, in truly coastal settings, it's possible to even select marsh, salt marsh plants as the basis for growth. Uh, this has been done in uh, a number of places. And what we see is that the same processes of denitrification, phosphorus assimilation, uh, organic carbon uh, transformation are being performed by the same microbial communities, but they're now in more of a brackish uh, of soil and water and uh, solution and is popular by plants that, are, that can tolerate that range of uh, brackish water. So I'd say that if that's really expected, which is very commonly seen, uh, then the plant species selection would lean towards uh, more plant species that are adapted to you know, salt and water. And, and, and many examples exist uh, in, the, in the coastal setting. All right.
Okay, another one. So, in small island states with scattered pig farms, the waste is often disposed of into local streams that carry it over near shore reefs. What would be a practical way to deal with this kind of disposal? No, oh, that's really a good question. Well, so let me say that there is a, a information available uh, that's produced by the U.S. EPA Environmental Protection Agency on uh, treatment of, of wastewaters from confined animal feedlot operations, which would include pig farms. The, the approach that's been taken uh, routinely is a form of an a initial lagoon, which allows for flows to equalize and be collected. And that lagoon allows, like I showed earlier, uh, is typically anaerobic and allows some settling of solids to occur. That water itself, the clarified water, can then flow into a constructed wetland. Uh, it would be relatively small, but it would be certainly far better than the raw water that's coming off of the, uh, uh, it would produce the water quality far better than, the, than the, what's coming off of the uh, pig farm right now. That <clears throat> The concern with these kind of uh, solutions I'm offering is that there may not be enough area or the farmer may wish to say it's too much land being consumed. Uh, but what we've seen is that if there's enough water, enough availability to store that water for just even a few days, it allows time for settling to take place. And if there's, and if there's additional room to allow uh, a, a wetland to be constructed, that can also be sized for a residence time of a couple of days. And that would significantly reduce the strength of that water easily by 50 to 80 percent, I'm sure, given the strength of that water that's coming off of there. So hopefully, uh, that is one approach that might be useful for your situation. Um, to collect flows from pig farms and, uh, and uh, uh, different you know, animal, animal operations is typically to feed to a centralized type facility is, is, is only possible if it's a very large system. Um, generally these th systems are, are spread out in the countryside. They're not exactly easy to get to and uh, the engineering and the, the cost for conveyance would be too much. Uh, as we said earlier in the presentation, we see the treatment process as this combined step of collection and conveyance to the treatment and then the discharge. If that effort to collect that flow to getting it to a treatment system is, is too great, uh, folks won't pay for it and they, will not, they won't implement it. It might be too difficult. So for these kind of systems, on, uh, you know, on-site solutions such as a small lagoon followed by a small constructed wetland would be a very significant improvement on the water quality for very low cost and very low operational effort. All right. So this is, I just have more and more questions, Jim, coming in. So, all right. What would a minimum threshold population, what would be a minimum threshold population to justify implementing a package plant rather than the individual units from no, the Julianne diamond? Uh, that is a, a very good question. Uh, I, I don't have the, the firmest answer on that, to be honest. Uh, uh, they've been built at a scales of uh, 10,000 gallons per day, you know, for a population of, say, 100, uh, 100 residences, potentially. Uh, 50 to 100 residences might be a lower limit to start thinking about a package plant. Uh, I, I know it's a good question. It's commonly uh, asked. Um, but uh, one issue with the package plant is, is the ability of the community to operate that. Uh, what is the method and, um, and unit, the, or the, sorry, the entity that would help operate that? Uh, if they can form their own uh, association or if they can uh, work together to develop a, a local sewerage uh, organization, able, they will be able to uh, operate that facility. Um, and it might, and that so the size of the community might be uh, that would be allow them to build a package plant might be limited by really how many people they need to, uh, how many, how much it costs to operate, and and how many uh, people will be able to contribute to that. Uh, I think you're, if you're in that 50 to 100 uh, residents range, uh, it would justify, uh, and certainly up, uh, it's very certainly justified up from there. What, what it almost a corollary answer to that question, though, is when is it too big a flow? When is it too big a population to support uh, using a package plan approach? And I think that we've seen is that once you're up in the um, 300,000 gallon per day flow range, uh, uh, it's or up to even a million gallons a day, which we've done in some cases, that's acceptable and makes sense as a package plant solution. They, they can certainly build them and they sell them up to 5 million gallons a day of flow which is a, a very small 
pretty large, pretty respectably sized small, small city. But uh, that is a kind of a, more of a site-specific analysis here. Uh, the, the intent here is that as people grow in their wastewater needs, uh, and, it, and either on-site appears to be un, um, un infeasible or uh, ineffective, uh, and there's no room for things like ponds or wetlands, then that automatically seems to switch towards a package plan approach. Uh, I hope that does answer the question. It's a very good question, and it's hard to say an exact uh, lower threshold. All right. So just wanted to give everybody a time check. We've reached an hour, but um, Jim has agreed to stay on and answer. We still have some questions that I have in line, so uh, just wanted to let people know that we will be staying on to answer a couple more questions. But this webinar will also be available um, by YouTube. So. Um, if you need to step off the webinar, you will be able to still hear the rest of the questions. We'll send out the link when we're done. So, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and ask a couple more questions that have been sent in. So, mm -hmm. um, this is from Nayala Frederick, who's in Grenada. Um, she was wondering, for areas without adequate treatment fac facilities in coastal communities, what are some of the suggestions you have for addressing the reduction of the nutrient pollution to the reefs? Right, so the areas without adequate treatment, and so I'm presuming that's a case where we are back to the situation where, at best, we might have cesspits or latrines. We don't even have potentially uh, uh, septic tanks. Um, I think the the answer there has to be a, a mixture of uh, education to the community of the importance of their the need, uh, a, a vigorous effort to find funding to help sustain a, a significant improvement in the local wastewater. Uh, to address the local wastewater problem, and then to start thinking about, uh, since you're almost starting at, uh, at such a raw level, a basic level, there's no existing infrastructure in place, um, doing a master plan to uh, uh, quantify as best one can the range of flows and their distribution, and estimate the costs for different approaches. Now, I know that may seem like it's not exact prescription, but until one really does that plan, uh, the best solution may not be available. If, you, if one is desperate and needs to do something right away, then I would try to find a way to collect that flow and put it into at least a pond and allow some aging of that water and maturation so that it can start, de start degrading and reducing the strength naturally, and, uh, and then take some of that flow and consider putting it through either another pond or another or a constructed wetland as a very low cost, lower cost, uh, lower technology approach. Uh, it wouldn't require extensive uh, operation or maintenance, uh, but there would be a need to monitor and maintain flows and levels within those ponds and wetlands within uh, a target range. Uh, it can all be built with local materials. That's one desirable feature of these lower technology approaches. You can build them on site. They don't have to be trucked in or flown in. Um, but I think that uh, if we, if you could collect the flows and you have enough of flow, uh, then a, a pond and wetlands uh, configuration is a good solution. If it's and one last question, one last point on that, Petra, if if the situation is such that that it's just not possible to collect the flows, then I would try to go back to that household level and implement a more uh, uh, organized uh, septic tank type approach. Uh, I've, I've worked on these kind of projects in developing countries and in, in the Southeast Asia. They almost always have a cesspit or a, a tank like that. It is possible to go back in and uh, connect septic tanks, and that would allow for additional treatment. And if that's the case, then a septic tank followed by a small gravel bed uh, type constructed wetland uh, on the order of, say, a, a square meter or two per unit per, per household member uh, would be enough to really significantly improve that quality of water coming from that site. Uh, I, and that's probably the, the best summary I can put at this point. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to call on Aaron Hutchins from USVI to um, ask his question. Aaron? Yeah, hi. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, Jim. Thanks. This is really helpful. Um, just in the Caribbean, at least, I'm sure in many other parts of the developing world, the cost of electricity is extremely high, and, and in many cases, the deterrent to mechanical systems requiring energy, the sustained cost of um, electricity. Another factor is the availability of maintenance materials locally. 
And so I just was wondering if you have, in your generalized cost guidance, the slide you had showing the approximate O&M costs and the upfront costs, et cetera, if that takes into consideration um, some of the real-world complications seen in coral reef jurisdictions, typically in um, isolated small island communities. Well, that's really a, an excellent and very appropriate question. Thank you, Aaron. I'd say that the, um, it's one thing to say that power is expensive, right? It's another thing to say, well, it's not even hardly available. You know, in some areas, we just don't even have it, or it's just so expensive as to be virtually unavailable. Um, in those cases, uh, the, these mechanical approaches really don't uh, stand up well. You know, they, for, for better or worse, they require some degree of power to operate, to maintain these uh, aerobic conditions, the aeration systems. And if that really is a true constraint, which I fully see that it can be and is in some areas, I would say that the, the pathway to take would be to look more closely at the pond and wetland combination. The ponds provide opportunities for settling, equalization of flow, uh, in situ degradation of those wastes and assimilation by uh, nutrients by algae in those ponds. And then wetlands provide a, a passive and low energy way of polishing that, removing the solids and in the, in the, in attached or uh, you know, nutrients or phosphorus, uh, nitrogen phosphorus to that. Um, I, I'm thinking that there are ways of en enhancing that process even further without mechanical, uh, without electrical power. One of the things that we've uh, seen grow as a technology in the last few years is what we call the intensification of wetlands. Sometimes it's with uh, the addition of uh, pumped air, uh, blowed, uh, air blown in from a uh, electrical source, but other times it's possible to create uh, more of a passive uh, uh, transfer of oxygen to that uh, into that wet water than a wetland by using a, uh, a a a passive siphon that is a, a dosing siphon that's allowed to water that fills and drains out of a siphon chamber and discharges uh, in a pulsed form. That pulse imparts some energy to the water, provides air to come in contact with a greater amount of water in a short period of time and that helps feed an aerobic process within the wetlands. Um, I think, you know, maybe there's follow-up uh, information that can be, I can provide Petra on this approach, but there, there are ways of dealing with the lack of power as long as one has um, the ability to kind of put water into a, a pond and allow it, and, and with enough topographic relief that you can take that water in a passive way and flow it through a series of uh, wetlands. That would be enough, I think, in that setting, it sounds like, to provide a significant improvement without the use of electric power. Okay, thanks, Jim. I still have a couple more questions. Are you good to do a couple more? Yeah, let's keep it going. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next one, what about mosquito issues with above ground systems, especially wetlands? Oh yeah, this is a, thank you for that question. It's a very significant issue in tropical and subtropical settings. Uh, what we see is that in freshwater, free water wetlands, like the, the two examples I showed, uh, the, some would have a standing water, some that are in a gravel or uh, an engineered media type of material that the plants to grow in. The ones of the surface water can be uh, sources of mosquitoes. They can provide habitat for mosquitoes to grow in. Uh, there are many methods of trying to manage that, and uh, they can be successful. Uh, one is that they, you make the wetlands with enough open area in some areas to encourage the growth of mosquito fish or natural predators or that can be natural or they can be introduced to help consume uh, the larvae of mosquitoes before they become problematic. Uh, it's also possible to add in uh, bacterial larvicides that are safe uh, to handle, uh, don't have residual ecological concerns as a way of managing and minimizing that potential for larv larval production. Uh, if that is a significant concern, though, where the potential for mosquito growth is, is, is real, uh, the selection of a gravel bed or engineered media type basin is the prefer preferred approach. It tends to add to slightly be more expensive because gravel or other soil type media might be expensive to add to the, to the concept, but it does erase the potential for um, a mosquito growth. That is, there is no free water surface for the mosquitoes to grow in and the treatment can still be provided uh, naturally, like we're describing here, without that potential threat. But I think it's a very uh, helpful question. It's part of the uh, analysis that needs to happen on the site-specific level 
of the appropriateness of the technology. Uh, a planning exercise can identify these issues and they can see if the solutions like I'm proposing here are really realistic for that setting. You know, one has to really know the setting and then know the population and the community and see what is perhaps the best fit. And it may not be necessarily the most textbook solution sometimes, as I'm sure folks on the call here have found out, there's, you have to improvise quite greatly sometimes in these settings. All right. Um, which, which one of the systems would you recommend for car stick? Is that how you say it? Sorry, I'm not a soil person. Soil areas such as the Yucatan Peninsula. We have septic tanks that are not working because of the nature of the soil. The wastewater is going straight to the reef. Well, that's really a concern. I, I, well, that exactly is the case in the Florida Keys, for example. You know, they're all built on old coral reefs. Um, the Yucatan's really um, even a greater example of that potentially. And these uh, reef material, these, these geologic reefs are very porous, um, and uh, the whole concept of a uh, soil filtration doesn't really apply. And I empathize with the questioner. I, I know the dilemma that's posing because it's a really a straight shot, if you will, of untreated water going out to the receiving waters. Uh, so that really was the same issue as that Florida has been facing in the Keys, and that's why we wanted to look at that example. Uh, there's, there are approaches that, have been, that can be taken. Uh, for example, if it's a septic tank solution uh, that's being implemented there at that site, um, the addition of an additional polishing unit to at least, as I uh, t tried to show here in this example of the passive uh, biological filter, it will, at least it would knock the nitrates down significantly uh, that would be exiting into that carcinogenic terrain. That is, the water from the septic tank would flow into these other uh, passive uh, biofilter basins, uh, and they would be these passive biofilters. They might be essentially another septic tank, frankly, filled up with wood chips uh, with a dividing berm, or it could be uh, barrels or tanks that are buried in the ground. And these, so they're not they're not the water is in those tanks is not leaving the systems until it's had time to react with the the wood chips and provide a level which provides that additional level of treatment. In that case. Even if you did have this porous terrain that the water is, 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 is leaving through, it will at least have received another uh, substantial reduction in treatment. Recall from that example that they found a 93% reduction in total nitrogen through that passive biofilter. Uh, that's a significant improvement for any septic tank situation. So then you, even if you know that it's going to be going back towards the reef, you'll know that if it treats the, receives that level of treatment, it will have been uh, improved by a factor of almost tenfold. If, uh, if it appears that on-site treatment is just not uh, sustainable, that is, you won't be able to maintain a level of uh, uh, scrutiny to make sure that it's being treated properly, that these uh, on attachments to the septic tanks are being maintained properly, then that speaks to uh, the need to try to collect that flow and put it to more of a centralized system uh, like they've done in the Florida Keys. It's a, it means typically a, a move towards more expensive treatment. It may be seen as too challenging because of that, but that would be the better solution if we can't seem to find a way to get um, treatment and at that uh, household scale. Uh, the intermediate solution of that might be to be thinking about can we at least collect the flows from those homes and put it towards a centralized pond that we could then line so that it's not leaking out, but it could be lined with a, a soil uh, layer or a plastic or polyethylene layer, and that would provide a level of retention and treatment to take place, and maybe that then could be fed into a, a wetland system. Again, though, the, the caveat and condition for, those, for that scenario is that you've been able, you're able to obtain some uh, liner materials that would help you keep that water in the wetland or in the pond and not just leak away. Okay, I have three more questions, and then I think I'll, I'll, I'll end the webinar. So this one was sent uh, from Amanda Ford. She works in with a Pacific Island community on a small but increasingly densely populated coral atoll island, around 800 people on an island of 800 by 200 meters, where there is no capacity to pump wastewater into a pond, and they need their groundwater. Currently, the sewage goes straight onto the reef, and the impact is obvious with a lot of 
cyanobacteria, etc. They've discussed mm -hmm. potential for composting toilets, but is this the only solution, and how hard are these for communities to maintain themselves? Oh, wow. Well, Amanda, you're, you're living the dream there of uh, being on the front line of trying to protect the water quality, and I sure appreciate that. Uh, I'd say that uh, this, is a, this is a situation where uh, if it's going straight to the reef um, and we have to protect the groundwater, uh, the composting toilets, which I haven't really mentioned here, and maybe it's an oversight, maybe it's just a matter of there's so many options in, at the household scale that we have to be saying somewhat general here in our approach, at least initially. Composting toilets have a lot of potential. Uh, if one can work with the community to educate them on the importance of it and, uh, and how to take care of it, these, they really are relatively low maintenance systems. Uh, they, they, there's definitely an aesthetics factor attached to composting toilets. That is, uh, this is essentially a, 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 a basin, a, a vessel that wastes are essentially being stored at, they're being allowed to decompose uh, naturally, um, and they're properly constructed, they can be vented so that the odors are really not a strong issue. In fact, it's, it's readily, that's one of the more manageable aspects of it. But one has to go in there periodically and remove the collected uh, wastes that have now degraded and presumably largely aerobically, so there's not as much volume, but one has to go in there and remove that and then uh, dispose of that either as a sludge uh, uh, in a landfill or uh, apply it as a uh, surface amendment. Uh, it's all possible to do that. Uh, the issue here is, of course, is once you've concentrated that waste into uh, uh, this uh, compost, uh, we don't really want to put it out there again so it can run off to the reef. So finding some repository for that uh, sludge over time or finding a way to distribute it and so that it's not leaching back to the reef would be part of the mission on that. I'd say, I'd say your solution you're proposing is, is a good one for that setting. Uh, I just emphasize that you'll need to really work with people and maybe possibly demonstrate it. Uh, one of these, I didn't speak to this much in the talk, but one of the ways to really try to make a breakthrough in a, in a setting where there's just no history of a decent wastewater management approach is to work with the locals and, and demonstrate it on, at one or more scales. Let them see for themselves the effort and the uh, condition and the improvement of water that you get with a uh, wastewater treatment approach like this um, before uh, trying to adopt or implement or impose that approach on a whole community. It, it, it needs to be uh, thought through in that way, and, I'm, and I know I'm probably not getting into all the level of detail necessary here to really resolve this question, but, uh, but I know that uh, a successful demonstration is a good way to build community support or an alternative approach to wastewater management. Uh, and that, that could include, in this case, the composting toilets. There's, and the, and the effort, for example, in that demonstration would be to really monitor that uh, management and operations need and, and the maintenance needs for that and confirm that the people can accept that. Um, so that may not be the hardest answer, Amanda. I hope that does help you a little bit, though, with your question. Okay, so the last two, Jim, um, do you know of any examples of some kind of integrated farm system that uses fish and algae or other combinations to process wastewater? This is from Rob Salm. Okay, yeah, Rob, uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one, of the, one of the approaches that's implemented in different parts of the world is, of course, to make the wastewater a resource, and you use it because it's high in nutrients. One can grow fish that can be consumed. Uh, the challenge is, is to make sure that there's enough oxygen to sustain the fisheries. So um, when thinking through a pond system, uh, the, uh, the more the typical first stage pond is almost too high strength. There's too much oxygen demand to support the fish. So one has to think in terms of a, an initial treatment system, such as that wastewater pond, uh, an, an anaerobic or facultative pond, that can then be uh, fed into a series of uh, shallower aerobic systems that can be used for culturing fish. Um, there are examples out there. Uh, it's been done. Uh, I'll have to think about a specific example that I might be able to feed back to uh, Petra and Rob and, and folks here at the, at the Reef Initiative here to uh, provide you with information on that. But there, is, there, are, there are examples of that where that's being done. I can say that. Oops, have I lost you? 
Oh my god. Okay. What about yeah. toilet separation systems? Are they more efficient than possibly a septic system to remove nutrients or bacteria? Yeah, the toilet, and I think where the, the question refers to a, kind of a urine and feces separation. You can have uh, 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 the liquid waste going to one tank or and the solid waste going to another. Uh, this is a really good way to reduce the total volume of wastewater to be treated uh, if, at that household scale. The liquid waste can be used as a, it can be allowed to, uh, either a soil filtration potentially for that treatment or even uh, potentially reused as irrigation uh, water. Uh, the fecal matter can be separated and what this means is that the uh, septic tank for that kind of uh, flow would be smaller. Uh, the, the fluids, uh, if it's being flushed or if it's being uh, 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 combined together, uh, really increase the volume of water to be treated. Uh, and I'd say this is probably a, a, a good way to uh, reduce the, uh, really, if you will, the size of the septic unit and, uh, and, and it's and probably, or for a given size, increase its lifespan. Um, but it's a, it's a little harder to say in a more general way. I, th I think that uh, in some parts of the world, uh, it's being adopted as an approach that makes sense uh, uh, I think that uh, it's probably too early to say how much more efficient it is in the long run. I think you need to be more information on that. So we had one more question come in. Would you be willing to take one final question? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In your experience, what option would you suggest to most adequately handle installation around volcanic rock or blue rock, such as in Hawaii? Okay, right. This is another case where I think the uh, the rock itself is that may be the only soil that is essentially it is just a rock covering. Uh, I, in all these cases where you have a really highly infiltrative, uh, a highly highly leaky surface soil, whether it's rock or, or media, there's almost always a need to uh, have some some form of uh, uh, separation there to hold that water in a vessel, whether it's a, a lined basin where it can be used for a pond or a wetland, for example, long enough so that it can have some opportunities for biological treatment. Otherwise, it's just going straight into the rock or it's in, in fractures and uh, out to the ocean without additional treatment. Um, you can use that media, the rock itself, as a, a crushed, crushed rock as a media for growing plants to provide this level of treatment. but. Uh, and I hope I'm not misunderstanding the question, but one has to separate that um, treatment basin with a liner or separation of some kind to keep the flow in there long enough to provide this level of biological treatment. Um, uh, I hope that answers the question. I, I think that it, it's, it's uh, um, to, be, to provide the most general answer I can on that, I think uh, it's commonly seen as an issue in like the earlier example we talked about the karsted environment or other rocky shorelines. It may be it may not even be possible to excavate or dig these kind of basins in that setting. But if one can create a kind of a burned off area with a uh, aligned system, uh, I'm sure you can improve the quality of water coming out of that through using a pond or a wetland system. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you so much and thanks to all the participants for joining us on this webinar. The webinar was brought to you through the generous support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. And the recording of the webinar, as well as the resource links that Jim mentioned, um, we can send it out to the Reef Resilience Network emailing, email list after this call, as well as to those of you that um, registered for this webinar. If you are not on the list and you want to be on the Reef Resilience list to find out about new webinars coming up and other, other services we have for coral reef managers, just email us at resilience at tnc.org. And please send us any suggestions for future webinar topics to that same email. Our next webinar is on March 17th, so it's coming up really soon. And we're going to explore enforcement strategies for marine protected areas. To register for that webinar, go to our website at reefresilience.org. Thank you. Thanks again.